All right, tonight we return to the study that we started last week, and this will be lesson two of our Bible school study for the month of July. The focal passage of Scripture is Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21, the latter part of that verse. This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. In lesson one, we learned last week about the importance of knowing Jesus and why he is the only one who is uniquely qualified, trustworthy and faithful to be the adequate guide that we need in our lives. And of course, our theme is tips for traveling life's journey and the title of the lesson last week was uh, know your guide tonight the title of this lesson is follow jesus as your guide on life's journey so this lesson builds up on the foundation that we laid last week in lesson one now it might seem like knowing the guide, following the guide, very close, and maybe would be one and the same. But I find that it's one thing to know a guide, it's another thing to follow the guide. There has to be a determined effort to follow the guide. Um, Following the guide of our life requires a commitment on our part as believers in Christ. And that commitment is one that should never waver no matter what we encounter in life. And there's a lot of difficulty that we sometimes encounter, difficult situations and so forth. And it seems that we have more of those things as we climb the age ladder over the years, i found that there are many people around us who like to try to influence the decisions that we make in life, what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to do them, who we're supposed to follow and so forth. But Jesus is the one that we always need to follow for sure and for certain. We really need to be committed to following him. I'm sure you have had people uh, that you have crossed paths with in times past who were very quick to suggest what you need to do. And if you follow their guidance, that may or may not be God's will. I've encountered people along life's journey over the years who uh, felt like they knew what was best for me and what I needed to do as an adult. Uh, but uh, it wasn't what God was leading me to do at the time. And therefore, you know, I chose to be committed to following the Lord and following his guidance in my life. And I'm grateful that I did. Think about these questions in regard to how you live your own life. There's three of them that I wanna give you real quickly. And only you can answer these questions as it relates to uh, how you live your life. Number one, who or what is most likely to influence you and help you to make wise decisions in your life? Probably all of us have one or more people or have had one or more people in our lives that we found to be very, very trustworthy and we would talk with them about decisions that we were contemplating, having not made the decision at the time that we were talking with them, but we trusted their counsel. And a multitude of counsel is good according to what the scriptures tell us. It's very important for us to, to try to get the, the best of counsel as we try to make decisions in life. But 
Who might that be or what that might that be for you in your life? The second question is who or what is most likely to influence you to make an unwise decision? And all of us here tonight would say, well, I don't want to make an unwise decision, but is it possible that something could cause us or someone could cause us to make an unwise decision? Probably looking back at our lives, there have been some times whenever we were influenced by someone. I can remember a time in my life where I was influenced in the workplace uh, by someone who felt like that I needed uh, to take a certain direction. And I told that individual then, I said, that's the wrong direction for me. And his resolve remained firm that that was the direction that I needed to go in. And so with him being my superior, I really didn't have any alternative but to follow uh, the course of action that he outlined. And it was miserable. It was a miserable course of action for me. And uh, thankfully, uh, I was bailed out of that situation a little bit later on because it did not suit me. I knew going into it that it was not going to suit me. I was pretty clear on that, but others thought different. Uh, that was not a wise decision uh, at that particular time uh, in my life. Last question that I just want you to think about is how important is it for you to please the most influential person or it might be more than one in your life, people in your life. How important is it for you to always please them? Most of us would say that there are certain people that we always want to try to please. We always want to try to please our spouse as best we know how, don't we? Uh, those of us that have children and grandchildren, we want to try to please them, don't we? Uh, certainly, you know. I've told you before that I always wanted to try to please dad and mom whenever I was growing up. I wasn't perfect in that, just like most children growing up. But uh, that was my desire. That's what I wanted to do. And then after I committed my life to Christ, my desire has been to please him as much as I know within my power to do, to please him. And I'm so grateful for his influence in my life. Well, all of that comes about by following people that we trust or people who influence us. The biblical account of Daniel and the three Hebrew children or his three friends as they're referred to is a very interesting one providing us with a wonderful example of commitment uh, regarding following God and what results from faithfulness and following God. And with that, we turn our attention to Daniel chapter 1. Now, I'm not going to read these 21 verses, but I am going to summarize them for you and encourage you to read them. And I'll refer to one or more verses during the course of finishing up the rest of the lesson tonight. But I want you to join me in discovering from their example what it takes to be a follower of God, to follow God, and as we say it today, to follow Jesus in our lives uh, each and every day. In the first chapter of Daniel, in the first seven verses, we find that Daniel and his three friends encountered a very, very difficult time in their life. It was a difficult situation for them. Now, a little bit of history about what took place here. Daniel and his three friends came to Babylon somewhere in the about the year 604 BC when Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon and his army, defeated the army of Israel. That defeat was very costly to Israel 
because Nebuchadnezzar took King Jehoiakim, who was the current king at that time of Israel, along with many of the Jews and some of the temple treasures that were in the house of God there, back to Babylon and kept them in cap captivity. The Babylonian king, with those that were there, Daniel and his three friends being a part of that, the king issued a decree or an order to Ashpenaz, who was the chief of his uh, court at that particular time, to select uh, those that he felt like were the sharpest young men of the Jews and make sure that he wanted to uh, Aspenaz to make sure that those young men not only were sharp, but they were of noble lineage and he wanted them to be set apart from everybody else. And he wanted them to be provided nourishment and so forth differently from everybody else. He made it very clear that he wanted the best of the best uh, to be chosen. He wanted them to be trained for three years in the Babylonian language and culture and then he wanted them through all of that training to be his servants who would serve under him. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the three Hebrew children were chosen among others and their training began. The first step was to change their names. Verse number seven says, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Now those are the names that we relate to, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We just roll that right off of our, our tongue, you know. We don't refer to them much by the correct name of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, but that was their names. We think of them more from the Babylonian names that they were given. So that was the first step in bringing about a change for them. Um, the second step was to provide them with the king's meat and with the king's wine so that they would develop physically the way the king thought that they would develop through this special diet that they were going to be provided. But both of those two steps were very problematic for Daniel and for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'll just use those names. Uh, very problematic. Why were they problematic? Well, the names Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were names of Babylonian pagan gods. And that was problematic for the, these men who were desiring to serve the true and living God. The meat and its preparation violated the laws of holiness that God had given to Israel. And therefore, uh, Daniel and his three associates but Daniel is mentioned here. It's certainly uh, right, I think, for us to include the other three along with Daniel, but Daniel specifically, uh, the scripture states here in verse eight, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. You see, if Daniel and his friends were going to be faithful to God and his laws, they knew that they could not eat the king's food and drink the king's wine. They were committed to following the Lord, God Almighty. But they realized that if they refused to take the provision of the king, that it likely was going to create 
uh, a consequence for them and they would have to suffer those consequences. Which leads us to the second thing to note about Daniel chapter 1 and that is that they determined, Daniel and his three friends, they determined who they were going to follow and whose influence they wanted to commit to and that set the stage for them to respond to this situation and respond they did verses 8 through 16 talk about their response here now daniel and shadrach meshach and abednego knew full well what the consequences were going to be for them they knew what their options were they understood their choices and they understood that if they chose to follow the God of Israel, that there was indeed going to be some consequences uh, to be experienced. They knew that the first option they had was to eat the king's food, disobey God's laws of holiness, and probably have a reasonably uh, good life there in Babylon submitting to the training of uh, those who were instructing them in the Babylonian ways and so forth but they also realized that they had another option option two and that was that they could obey God and risk being punished for not complying with the king's order that had been made so they understood very well but because they were committed to following God and remain so they were able to respond to this situation in a remarkable way they didn't hesitate I don't see any hesitation on the part of Daniel here whenever I read chapter 8 it wasn't like he was in turmoil saying what in the world should I do? I need to make a decision here. I need to make a choice. Uh, what do I really need to do? Daniel did not hesitate from what I read here. He purposed in his heart that he wouldn't defile himself. And his friends apparently joined with him in that. I believe they did. And they decided that they would be faithful to God regardless of the consequences encountered. And so they did. So they did. They knew their guide for their life and they made a conscious decision that they were going to follow uh, the guide that they had come to know and that was the God of Israel. So with God as his guide, Daniel seems to me to take the lead role here. At this point, we hear more from him and about him than we do from the other three, but we're going to talk about them further in another lesson. We'll come to that uh, a bit later on. So with God's guidance in his life, having committed himself to the Lord, Daniel sets out to become creative in determining how they can work through this situation that he and the three Hebrew boys are in. So he goes to Aspenaz and he offers him a pretty creative alternative. Uh, it's, a, it's an easy one. Uh, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs and the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. Verse 8 tells us that he requested that he might not partake of this uh, that the king had ordered for them. And Aspenaz said, for why should he see your faces worse lacking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. So while Aspenaz was inclined to listen to Daniel, and I think he was 
compassionate toward Daniel, but he was more concerned about himself and he was more concerned about being punished by the king if the end result was not exactly what the king was looking for. And so he turned Daniel down. So Daniel offered the proposal to the guard that was assigned to them. Verse 11, Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over them, the three, the four of them, and he offered the same proposal to him. And so he made it very clear. He said, let our countenances be looked upon before thee in the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter. And 10 days later, he put them in front of him and he compared them with the others that had eaten the king's portion and drank the king's wine. And guess what? You know the story, don't you? Puts a smile on our face. At the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Boy, that's what God can do, isn't it? All we have to do is just follow him. Just follow him. That's all we have to do. Daniel and his friends then were honored by remaining faithful to following their guide as you read through the rest of the chapter there. Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should eat and gave them pulse just like this was the others that were there, just like uh, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And God continued to bless these uh, four men there. Full credit has to be given to the power of God. That's why I said what I did a moment ago. It's amazing what God can do. Verse 17 says, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And boy, things were beginning to be to come into place for how God was going to use these young men in his plan in future days. They wanted to follow him. He excelled along with his friends, but he was able also the scripture says here to understand visions and dreams and provide interpretations. Boy, that was going to come into play in the not too distant future, wasn't it? And indeed it did. After the king interviewed all the young men, he decided that Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah were superior to all the others. As a matter of fact, they were found to be 10 times better than his own staff as a result of eating what they were eating compared with what he had decreed for everybody else to eat. And so for over 40 years, Daniel continued to serve Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible says in verse 21, so Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus, and that involved 40 years approximately. He remained faithful to God, and he continued to follow him despite all the pressure to disobey. And we'll look at another example of him just a little bit later on, as you remember the story of him being in the lion's den. Well, let me close it up real quickly. <clears throat> Today, God doesn't expect you and me to comply with the old covenant sacrificial rituals and so forth that these men <clears throat> were bound to and had to uh, make sure that they um, uh, complied with. God required holiness of them, but God also requires holiness of us. He is holy and we're to be holy just like him. But 
Jesus Christ made a difference between then and now. You see, the sacrificial death of Christ at Calvary and his resurrection from the dead placed those who have been born since then under a new covenant. You and I are under the new covenant and a new way of relating to God. The Bible refers to it as a new and living way. It's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, having that blood applied to our hearts and lives. He being the one and only sacrifice, his sacrifice having an eternal effect, uh, being the covering for our sin or the means of the forgiveness of our sins, uh, making us right in the sight of God. Therefore, the Lord now expects you and me to live under the direction of this new covenant that we are a part of and to love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love our fellow man as we love ourselves and to obey His most complete revelation of truth. That is his darling son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God expects us to follow his son, Jesus Christ, as believers in the body of Christ. <clears throat> he enables us to know the truth of what we're supposed to do through the word that we have to read and to study. We also have the Holy Spirit to lead and guide in our lives each and every day. And as I so often say, and I hope you never tire of hearing me say it. I sure am glad he's in my life. I'm glad he guides me each and every day and directs my life. I thank my God that the Holy Spirit is present with us in the world today to be our guide and we can follow him. When we place our faith in Jesus and trust him to be our guide, we also commit to follow and obey him in all situations that we encounter. That's exactly what Daniel and his three Hebrew friends did. They committed to follow the God of Israel, no matter what the circumstances or what the situations were. You and I know very well that we may encounter difficult situations in life. I would say, probably on behalf of all of us here tonight, <clears throat> that as we look back into the past, there have been some very, very difficult situations that we struggled with. I've had those situations. Uh, but <clears throat> what I learned after the fact was that those situations tested my commitment to the Lord Jesus and my faithfulness to him most of the time. And you probably have learned the same thing, that the test that you've encountered in your life really, really uh, put strain on your commitment to the Lord and your desire to be obedient to him. But when we are committed, it makes it easier. So knowing that we are likely to encounter even in the future for most of us we could still encounter uh, certain situations and things that we know nothing about tonight do not anticipate or anything like that but they come upon us as those things which are unknown and very unexpected how do we prepare for that how do we prepare for that well, I think the answer begins with knowing our guide. Then it follows in step two, follow our guide. And as we do that, I'll offer these suggestions to you. We need to renew our commitment every morning to obey God's truth and be faithful to his will. Now, I want you to think about that. <clears throat> um, you know, my submission to God's will in my life, I've told you about whenever I submitted to the ministry. I can't go back and resubmit to that anymore. 
but I can maintain a renewal of my commitment each and every day to continue to persevere for the Lord. And it's wonderful when we do that, when we renew our commitment every morning. When we start the day out and we say, Lord, I renew my commitment to you today. I have surrendered my life to you. I belong to you. I'm glad that I know you. And I, with all of my heart, want to follow you as my Savior. And so therefore, I renew my commitment to you this morning for today to honor you and live for you as best I know how. You see, if our heart is set on being faithful, then choosing to follow God will be much, much easier for all of us, no matter what age we have achieved in our lives. If we have a heart that desires to be faithful, we have set the right course for us to follow in our lives. Following God will be much easier. So let me encourage us to make it a practice, if we don't already do it, to renew our commitment each morning to follow Jesus as our guide because He'll never lead us astray. Amen. He'll always lead us in the way that is right. He'll take us where we need to go. He'll keep us safe from those things that uh, we sometimes fear in our lives. Uh, it's a good thing. It's just a good thing for us to do. Follow our guide each and every day. Father, thank you for the lesson. Thank you for how it speaks to my heart. I pray that it'll speak to all of our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, guide and direct all of us and that we will follow you as you lead us in our lives. And may our purpose and our determination already be uh, as strong as that of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so that when we face situations that uh, test our resolve to be obedient to you and to continue to follow you, we will not yield to those situations, but we will remain firm in following you as the guide of our life a wonderful tip here for us to follow. Renew every day our resolve, our commitment to live for you. Help us to do that, and may you guide us to new heights in you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.